Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. <clears throat> I'm glad to have you guys here on this. Uh, it's the 24th of January, a Wednesday, 2024. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to get started. we got a lot to cover. But first thing I want to talk about is I've been observing the... Uh, we've had basically a, like a proxy war going on where the United States has been supplying Ukraine with with weapons and Ukraine's been doing the fighting against Russia and it gives you a little bit of insight uh, the heating up of the nations uh, divided between East and West you know NATO against uh, <clears throat> against uh, the BRICS nations and it's it's given me a little bit of insight into this whole thing in fact a lot of insight into this whole thing uh, and I'm starting to change my opinion on the, uh, on the, the, you can see the inner, in other words, basically what I'm saying is you can see the interaction. You can start to see which way this thing is going. And you all know that they've made threats that there's going to be a World War III. And in fact, Germany has went out and a number of, uh, well, we had the, uh, Letters from the Pentagon, General Minhan, the Minhan Memo, and then we've had uh, Germany releasing these uh, papers on how they think, and we see the buildup of these military exercises right next to Russia. We also see the buildup on the Russian side in, in Belarus toward World War III, and, and it's starting to give me an idea how World War III could actually play out. I'm starting to think now that at all costs they're going to avoid trying to get into a all full out nuclear con nuclear confrontation. I think they're going to avoid it at all costs, but they still want to have this power struggle. So what are they fighting over? <clears throat> Let's get down to the basics of it. They're really fighting over control and dominance of the world's monetary system. We got two blocks out there. We've got the NATO bloc, which controls the world's monetary system right now through the petrodollar. And then we have the BRICS bloc that want to have dominance in the world of the world's monetary system. And, and so it's coming down to a showdown. And what's the world's biggest vulnerability? Communications. How I'm reaching you right now. Communications are the world's biggest vulnerability. And you know, back during World War II, it was different. Communications was not a vulnerability. That wasn't there back then. And so they had to fight on, on, uh, on, in real time to obtain dominance back during World War II. But now dominance can be obtained... And also another thing has come up. I'll call it regime change. And a lot of wars in the modern time now, just maybe since the year 2000 forward, uh, what they fight over is trying to bring about what's called regime change. And it basically amounts to uh, creating such difficulties within a country so that the people then overthrow their, their government and it brings about regime change. So we got all these factors and warfare is changing too. The whole face of warfare is changing. Uh, things like tanks are not such a, and the amount of tanks you have are not so important as, as, as drone technology now. And also the observations of the enemy gives you a distinct upper edge. The face of war is changing itself. And so what are we dealing with here with these nu nuclear weapons? We're dealing with technology from the 1940s. Almost 100 year old technology. In the face of a modern war. Where the vulnerabilities now are definitely communications and the people themselves inside the country how the war is reflecting off of the people that live in your particular country how much uh, morale do they have to fight and so adding all these features in together and also the distinct 
it's very distinct that now they do not want to the the in other words what i'm saying is these nuclear weapons are more of a deterrent than anything else now conventional weapons are becoming and especially drone technology is becoming more important in the face of the actual war where the nuclear weapons are, are mostly as a deterrent so do i think that there's going to be an all-out nuclear war with a nuclear winter perhaps that'll never happen in a world war three perhaps it'll be more about destroying your opponent's ability to communicate and bringing about a, a change in your opponent so that you've basically won what would be the tactical victory well when you're when you are have it so that that you are governing the financial system and your opponent has brought about a regime change to the point where you're basically the boss then not so much about taking the actual land but being the boss they want the, the right now the Federal Reserve is the boss. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, and Chairman Powell, they are basically the boss of the world right now because they control the money, the seat of the money, of what's the world reserve currency. And, of course, we got a huge problem there because that itself is based on a Ponzi scheme. Uh, what a mess we got. But we got to get in because I don't want this show to be too long. I've already talked almost seven minutes. Uh, we got to get in and find out what's going on in the world today. Russia, uh, Russian official says another conflict with Ukraine is inevitable. So what do they mean another conflict? They're already in a conflict. Well, you got to listen carefully to the statement. And if we press on here for a little bit, we find out who said this. Uh, and we also set, see what sort of meaning it had. Just a second. That was the article about the German military uh, talking about World War III. Russian off official says another conflict with Ukraine is inevitable. Uh, you guys know how my internet can act up. Well, there... German, we, we already know about this. German military predicts World War III as soon as 2025. So this is why we're talking this morning on this show right now. Is because... And, and, and listen, we're going to get into the doomsday clock this morning because they made their prediction as well. So, uh, taking a look. Things are heating up in Taiwan as well. Do you remember the Chinese flew a balloon over North America? Right across America, right across the heartland of America, right over the the pay, the uh, nuclear missile silos. Uh, the Minuteman, nuclear missile silos. Not that long ago. Now they're flying their, their balloons over the, the airspace of, and, of, of Taiwan. Uh, says Taipei. Uh, Taiwan said Monday that six Chinese balloons either flew over the island or through its airspace just north of it. You know what the Chinese have got? They can take three tactical nuclear weapons and, and, and hang them from the bottom of the balloon to be detonated at high altitude. They have that balloon. I, I don't have pictures of it on here, but I did have pictures of it. I, I put it on one of my shows here. And it flies like 80,000 feet. Now, you know an interesting thing about this. The United States did tests. I think it was Operation Hardtack back in the 1950s, I think it was. Uh, I'm not sure. It might not have been. It might have been a different one. Uh, that might not have been Hardtack. But it was one of those operations that they did back in the 1950s where they were testing nukes. And the interesting thing about it is, is when they blow off a nuke just above the ground, it releases a radio, a, a electromagnetic pulse, which destroys all electronics. 
but it doesn't go very far when it's just released above the ground or at ground level or just above ground level and most of these nukes they blow them off just above ground level I think several thousand feet in the air which is considered at ground level practically because it's so low but what they found out was if you blow off a nuke up like 80,000, 100,000 feet up, way up high in the atmosphere, they found out that the electromagnetic pulse is significantly stronger. A thousand times stronger because it interacts with the upper atmosphere, with the uh, charged particles in the upper atmosphere. The electromagnetic pulse off of a nuke. So we already know these spy balloons can carry nukes but what would be the tactical advantage of using a spy balloon over say using a ICBM is the nature of the electromagnetic pulse would be a thousand times stronger so instead of destroying things on the ground like factories and stuff like that it wouldn't have little effect on infrastructure destroying infrastructure but it would destroy all the electronic components on the ground and so that's what we're talking about here and so they floated six of these Chinese balloons through Taiwan's airspace and I would consider uh, uh, myself I, I think that that is a, a, a distinct threat to Taiwan I mean uh, uh, these six balloons flying over you know for crying out loud just like it was a threat to America when they flew the Chinese balloon over it says, uh, one of these balloons passed near the southern city of Ping Tung. Yes, I think I pronounced it right. P-I-N-G-T-U-N-G. -G. Ping Tung. What a name for a city. <laughs> Ping Tung. Where do you live? Oh, in Ping Tung. <laughs> I, it's kind of funny. But I mean, <laughs> uh, and also another one near the port of Keelung. K-E-E-L-U-N-G, <laughs> where, uh, where Taiwan has an important naval, naval base. Now, in Ukraine, uh, Russia is now talking about a spring offensive that's raising fears that Kiev is ill-prepared to face it. Uh, it says, uh, analysis suggests that Russia may be on the early stages of a new offensive in Ukraine on the ground. Moscow forces have intensified their attacks along major s sections of the front line and have made small territorial gains over the past few weeks, taking new territory or reclaimed territory. Uh, the Russians are... Well, you guys know that they annexed four regions in eastern Ukraine. Russia did. And basically, at this point in time, I think Russian... Russia considers that their, 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 theirs. And I don't think they plan on giving it up, you know. Uh, at any rate, now they're planning on a new offensive. Uh, when's this new offensive? Probably in the spring, I would imagine. You know, maybe late spring, I don't know. Just guessing. Now, uh, two important events this week could determine the future of Fed policies and Fed rate policy. So we're waiting for news. News going to come in just tomorrow. But, you know, the markets right now have priced in these cuts. And that's why the market's at all-time high right now, because they've already priced in Fed cuts, rate cuts. But they priced it in, I think, a little bit prematurely. It says markets have become less convinced that the Federal Reserve is ready to press the button on interest rate cuts. Two big economic reports coming up this week could go a long way toward determining at least which way the central bank policymakers could lean and how markets might react to a turn in monetary policy. Investors will get their first look at the broader picture of the fourth quarter economic growth for 2023 when the Commerce Department releases its initial gross domestic product estimate on Thursday. Economists surveyed by Dow Jones are expecting 
the total of all goods and services produced in the United States economy to have grown by at least 1.7% in the final three months of 2023, which would be the slowest since the 0.6% decline of quarter two of 2022. A day later, so that'd be on Friday, the Commerce Department will release the December reading on the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, a favorite Fed inflation gauge. So, depending on what happens here. Okay, so right here it says lowered rate cut outlook. The release comes amid markets snapback where the Fed is headed. As of Friday afternoon, trading the Fed's funds futures markets equated to virtually no chance the rate setting Federal Open Market Committee will cut in its January 30 to 31st meeting, according to the CME group. Of course, they say that's nothing new. Uh, but the reduction at the March meeting fell to 47.2%, a steep slide from just 81% a week ago. So that could have a profound effect upon the markets, not a positive effect, because they've already priced this in. So we're going to have to watch. But, you know, I'm going to tell you, the markets really, uh, Ray, at this point in time, are, are totally reliant upon these interest rates coming down. And if they get too overly disappointed, we could see a, a rather steep correction, quite seriously. Uh, okay. Now, we're going to talk about the doomsday clock. You guys been following that? They've left it unchanged. Still, uh, what is it, 90 seconds to midnight or whatever? They haven't changed it. With all that's going on, with the theater pointing toward a World War III scenario right now. And they're still keeping it. Now, I'm questioning myself, why did they keep it? What would be their motive of keeping it at 90 seconds to midnight? Well, people out there are starting to get nervous. They're getting on edge about all this. They're starting to think, hey, you know what? Uh, this is dangerous. Uh, we're, they're talking about World War III. They're doing military exercises over in... Oh, and, and there's a buildup of nuclear weapons in, in Belarus. And Belarus is saying, oh, okay, uh, any, any, uh, anything that goes on that, that... In other words, Belarus has got their finger on the trigger. You know? And they got nuclear weapons now. Not just Russia. And, and so then on the other side of the border from Belarus, we got Poland that's doing an absolutely huge military buildup. And, and NATO exercises going on everywhere. But they're keeping this right at 90 seconds to midnight and not moving it closer. I think that they don't want to get the people any more excited than they already are about all this. Now, Turkey has said that they're going to approve Sweden's membership in NATO right now. And it says the decision lifts major hurdles towards Sweden's entry into the military alliance. So, Turkey's parliament on Tuesday approved Sweden's membership into NATO, lifting that major hurdle. So, Turkey is one of these countries is a NATO member, but at the same time, they don't always agree. Countries don't always agree on things, but now Turkey's agreeing on this. And that's, that's kind of big. In other news, Donald Trump, he's won New Hampshire, the primary in New Hampshire. Now this article says that the rematch with Biden appears increasingly likely. So we got that going on. And we're coming up to a major United States election of the presidential election coming up later this year. Of course, all you guys, most of you guys in my audience, you already know this. You know, and you've probably already picked your candidate, candidate, who you want to see. Uh, 
And so we're moving closer and closer to that by the day. It seemed like it was quite a far, far ways off there, like last year and stuff. And now it seems like it's just right on our doorstep now. It's getting really close. Boy, I, I don't know where Donald Trump gets his teeth done, but my gosh, his teeth are white, clean looking and nice looking teeth he's got. Wow, they just sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, you ever notice that a lot of the people that are in, uh, either in, in uh, they, they work in, uh, nowadays, you know, I remember back in the old days, back in the 1970s, 1980s, you know, news, news reporters and stuff, they had normal looking teeth. The teeth you come with, you know, are never as white as the teeth that they get when they get them all done. You know what I mean? They're, they're as white as bleach. And people get used to seeing teeth that are whiter than bleach, whiter than snow. You know, people get used to that out there. And they say, oh my gosh, you know, when they see somebody who has just has normal teeth. Somebody who's never had their teeth done professionally. The, uh, but that's the way what we used to see all the time. That's what we were used to, like back in the 1980s and stuff, you know. You know, even rock stars and stuff had bad teeth. And, and they kind of made fun of that, you know, in the Austin Powers movies, you know, with Austin's teeth. You remember? <laughs> anyway, okay. Moving on to the gold price. Okay, well, we get back on silver at 22.66. So silver's up 24 cents. But this is a bit of an unusual day because gold is down 16 bucks at 20.12. So this is a little bit unusual because generally this pair travel together. Gold goes up, silver goes up. Silver goes up, gold goes up. Seeing silver take off a little bit more than gold is a little bit unusual today. Now, as far as cryptocurrencies go, Bitcoin is, well, she's got back above 40,000. She was 39,000 or something this morning. Uh, she's 40,032 right now. And Ethereum is at 2235. And we're looking at XRP at 51.5 cents. So that's your cryptos today. Uh, looks like you're starting to bounce back a little bit. Uh, from whatever caused it to fall. What did I hear caused it? Was it, was it that Mounts Gox situation or whatever? I haven't kept up on it. Uh, I think there's a huge wallet out there, Mount Gox wallet or something. It's got like 500,000 bitcoins or something. I remember that during that, there was a time years ago when Mount Gox was the big thing. They were the big Bitcoin clearing house. They were the big trading place where everybody kept their bitcoins. And the bitcoins, it was all Mount Gox, Mount Gox, Mount Gox. That's what it was, you know. But that's back when Bitcoin was 200 bucks <laughs> or less, you know, going back in the, back in the day. Now, crude oil today. Oh, the market. 38,031. You know, I, I'm going to tell you, this is awfully high, the market. And she's up today again, 125 points. If they don't get a good Fed looking out, an outlook from the Fed, a good outlook from the Fed, they're not going to be happy. I'm going to tell you. They're, they're pricing in these rate cuts. Uh, crude oil today is 75.43, and it is up a dollar six, which is quite a big jump for crude. It's getting up, starting to head up toward eighty dollars again. Now, bonds and rates today, we're seeing bond yields rising. We're looking at 4.15 on the 10-year. It's up 1.7 basis points. And the 30-year is up 1.9 basis points at 4.39. And taking a look at the U.S. dollar index is at 103.8 today. And it looks like it's down a little bit. Been a falling... And it's funny to have the price of gold falling at the same time the dollar's falling. You know, but we've been seeing these anomalies happen more lately. That's the reason why these anomalies are happening, guys. Is because the markets now are, are totally controlled. Ever since the great financial crisis, they took control over the markets. 
and they use things like this exchange stabilization fund they use things like the uh, plunge protection team and whatever and I mean they're able that's when the market starts to get volatile they use these these things but they also have an awful lot of, of other ways picture it kind of like I, I'll tell you do you remember the movie The Wizard of Oz? You remember they finally found the, the old wizard and they pulled back the curtain and there he was. And he had all these day, gauges and dials and knobs he was able to twist. Well, that's what the Fed is like. As far as the economy is concerned, they're able to twist all these knobs, gauges and dials. And if something goes terribly wrong, they can invent things that you've never heard of before. To inject money into the system. And in fact, you know, I mean, how many of us back before the great financial crisis knew what quantitative easing was? Any of you out there ever heard of quantitative easing before the great, the great financial crisis? Back in 2000, say 2005, right? They can invent new stuff you haven't heard of yet. Because they have the ultimate control. And consider that control as a tool, like a hammer. Okay, and what that hammer is, the creation of new monetary units. That's what their hammer is. That's what their tool is. One tool they have, but it's a very, very powerful tool. But the problem is, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail if you get a problem. And so, they're not going to react until there's a problem and so there was a big reaction here that happened you know back when we had 2020 and this virus hit and everything and they they reacted the markets fell off like a stone and you saw the big reaction they had actual actual physical fiscal stimulus those stimmy checks they sent everybody in the mail. Also, the unemployment, too, was like bonuses and everything. There was money floating around every which way because they were using their hammer. But what they've done is now is, is all that money was floating around, and what they've done is, is these policies they've had recently are exactly the opposite. They're tightening policies. But it's taken quite a while for that money, that liquidity that they created after 2020, when they used their hammer, it's taken quite a while for it to dry up, but it's starting to really dry up now and dry up fast. So soon, I can tell you when, there's going to be another crisis, but very soon they're going to have to use that hammer again. But this time they've got to the point where we have inflationary pressure now. And using that hammer is going to lead to greater inflationary pressure. Okay, listen, guys. Thank you for listening to my show. Push that thumbs up button. And we'll catch you guys in the next episode. And you guys have a great day. Bye-bye.